Let me read this passage, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get started. Acts chapter 20, we're going to begin in verse 17. Now from Miletus he sent out to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said this, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews how I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in the public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks the repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself. If only I may finish the course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that uh, none of you among whom I have gone out proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. It's the second time he makes that statement. Pay careful attention to yourselves and all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to the Lord and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's gold or silver or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and those who were with me. And all these things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus, who himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. And there was much weeping on the part of all. And they embraced Paul and kissed him. And being sorrowful the most because of the word that he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Father, would you please be with us this morning and speak to us in the name of our Savior and our Lord Jesus. Amen. We were joking yesterday. I'm not sure if any of you uh, received this as well, but this week was the release of the Disney Plus streaming service. Amen. And uh, we've had, uh, we've had uh, quite a few uh, episodes and movies and television shows that begin with a castle and a set of mouse ears. And in fact, we were talking yesterday, I asked the kids what, what movies they had watched, and I, I said, listen, you all have watched more movies in 24 hours than I've watched in 24 years, amen? <laughs> and, and I say that jokingly, just because I, I, will, uh, I watch about one movie a year, one movie a year. So uh, I don't have a large reservoir of movies, but my favorite movie of all time, probably my favorite movie of all time, is a movie called Remember the Titans. Just, it's just, it's just my, my favorite. I love the movie. Remember that I could watch that movie every single day. It would not get tired of it. It's a story that took place in uh, 1971, I believe, in uh, Virginia. And what had basically happened is two schools um, had very successful uh, football championships. 
Uh, one school was an all-white school, another school was an all-black school, and the schools uh, were desegregated and came together to form a new high school. And when they formed the new high school back in 1971, they had to integrate two successful teams into one team. And the coach from the, from the, uh, from the historically black school became the uh, head football coach of the integrated school, amazing part uh, played by Denzel Washington. But uh, two of the captains, there were basically two captains on the team. Uh, the one was an all-American uh, from the white school named uh, Gary Bertier, Gary Bertier. And uh, there was a gentleman from the African-American school whose name uh, was Julius. And one of the critical scenes in the movie, uh, the players had not been getting along well, and uh, they went to camp, and when they went to camp, they began doing two and three a days, and uh, the tension, the racial tension, and the tension of just having two schools come together uh, really began to surface and to uh, boil over. And one of, the, one of the transitional scenes in the movie happened after a late practice one time when, uh, when, when Gary Bertier and Julius ran into each other. And uh, they, begin, they, they ran into each other and began to have some confrontation, and the scene played out this way. Julius said this, and I'm just going to quote what the movie says. Julius said, quote, well, what I've got to say you really don't want to hear because honesty ain't too high on your people's priority. Bertier says back, honesty? You want honesty? He says, honestly, I think you're nothing. Nothing but a pure waste of God-given talent. You don't listen to nobody, man. You, you don't listen to Doc or Boone, who is the coach, or Shriver. He says, push on the line every time, and you blow right past him. Push him, pull him, do something. But you can't run over everybody in this league. And every time you do, you leave one of your teammates, like me, hanging. Me in particular. Julius says, man, why should I give a hoot about you? Or anybody else out there? You want to talk about the ways? You're the captain, aren't you? Bertier says, right. Julius says, you got a job? Bertier says, I got a job. Julius says, you've been doing your job? Bertier says, I've been doing my job. Then Julius says this. Then why don't you tell your white buddies to block for Rev better? Because they have not blocked for him worth a blood nickel, and you know it. Y'all know the scene, don't you? <laughs> he says, nobody plays, yourself included. I'm supposed to wear myself out for the team? What team? Nah. I'm going to do what is good for me and look out for myself, and I'm going to get mine. Bertier says back to him, See, man, that's the worst attitude I've ever heard. And Julius says, Attitude reflects leadership, Captain. It, 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 is, it is the point in this movie where Bertier begins to recognize that the problems on the team may not have been caused by him, but he is the one that can do something about it. It, it, it is such a great metaphor for leadership because Julius is exactly right. That attitude reflects leadership. And we, as we've been mentioning earlier, are in a desperate need for great leadership. We're in a desperate need for leadership within our community. We're in a desperate lead, need for leadership within, uh, within, within the other institutions and establishments we're in. But so it seems that, that great leadership is so hard to find. And I just wish that God had something to say about it. Well, I got good news for you. In this passage, God says a few things about how you and I can be the leaders that God has called us to be. Now let me say something about this passage that we're going to look at this morning. In all the books of Acts, in all the book of Acts, Paul speaks over and over again. In fact, much of the book of Acts uh, contains the sermons of Paul. Paul speaks to the uh, ruling authorities, he speaks to the, uh, to, to the Jews, he speaks to the Gentiles, he speaks to those that, uh, that he's in prison with. He's, but this is the only time in Acts where Paul preaches a message, watch this, he preaches a message, the only time in Acts, right here, to Christians. 
and all the times that Paul addresses people in Acts, it is only here that Paul speaks to the Christians. And he speaks about leadership and how leadership ought to, uh, how, 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 how leadership ought to um, demonstrate attitude and how the church in Ephesus can be changed when leaders lead the way that God has called us to lead. So let me just share with you this morning, just real quick, six leadership principles that we see here in this section in Acts. Can you, can you all walk with me real quick? Let, let, let me go through them real quick. Let me go through them. With, I, I think that when we have leadership that lasts, leadership that's contagious, leadership that makes a difference, whether, whether you are, whether you are a, a leader in the church or whether you're a leader in the classroom, whether you're a leader on your job, whether you're a leader in your family, there, 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 are, there are certain characteristics that, that, that make all the difference in the world. Let me, let me just walk through them real quick with you. Number one, is a, it, it, n number one, the first characteristic we see of great leaders, this first attitude of great leaders is this, that is that they're honorable and consistent. Honorable and consistent. Let me show you how we see it here, beginning in verse, um, verse 18. Paul says this, when he came to him, he said, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that what happened to me helped through the plot, help even though this plots of the Jews. Then in the next verse, next verse, he says how I didn't shrink back from declaring anything to you both in public and from house to house. One thing we notice about the character of Paul in that is that it was consistent. From day one, Paul was the same man. In fact, he was the same man from day one to the final day that he was there. He was consistent when he was teaching publicly. He was consistent when he was teaching house to house. Over and over again, Paul had a character that was consistent. And one of the things that people long for in leadership is but both honor and consistency. People don't mind uh, speed limits. What people mind is when they get cited for speeding and other people don't get cited for it. P people don't mind rules enforced as long as the rules are enforced consistently. People don't mind it. People don't mind rules enforced and character enforced if, if the leader is following the same characteristic as everybody else. And Paul says here, you, you've been able to observe my life when I've been with you publicly, when I've been with you privately, when I've been with you in, in, in the halls, when I've been in with you from day one, when I've been with you, when I've been with you in, in, uh, from home to home, when, when we've set up late night talking and, and I was preaching and the guy fell out of the roof and I, and I fell out of the window and I hear you, you've seen everywhere I've been how there's been a consistency of character. And that's one of the things people long for in leadership. In fact, I remember this when I was teaching school, they, they taught us this. They said it's the consistency of discipline, the certainty of discipline, not the severity of discipline that makes the difference. Which means when you as a parent, as you as a parent, when you set a rule for your child and you don't enforce it and don't enforce it and don't enforce it and don't enforce it and finally you get fed up and then you give the child the death sentence for doing something that he's gotten away with 10 times before, it confuses the child. What, what, what children, they say, oftentimes need is not severe discipline, but just consistent discipline throughout. It's consistency that people want oftentimes more than anything else. God doesn't expect leaders to be perfect, but he does expect leaders to be consistent. Charles Spurgeon used to tell the story of, uh, used to tell the story of the, the, the preacher that was so good that uh, every time he preached in the pulpit, they said that he should never leave, and every time he got out of the pulpit, he acted up so much, they said he should never go back, amen. <laughs> said it was a completely inconsistent how he could behave one way outside the pulpit and a different way inside the pulpit. But he says what God wants really above everything else is he wants consistency of character. That you are the same person no matter where you are. To be a great leader, to be a great coach, to be a great parent, there has to be a life of consistency. The second thing that we see in the, in the life of Paul here is not only a, a, a life of consistency, but a life of obedience himself. In other words, Paul is asking the Ephesians to be obedient to God, but he's not asking the Ephesians to do something that he's not willing to do himself. 
And obedience is not easy. If it was easy, it would not be obedience. Amen? If you're told to do something you want to do and you do it because you want to do it, you're not being obedient. You're just doing what you want to do at that time. Obedience is obedience when you have to follow when you don't want to. And Paul demonstrated what it was like to be obedient to Christ. Let me, let me show you how we see it here. Beginning in verse 22. Paul says this. He says, Behold, I'm going to Jerusalem. That word constrained, it really means to be bound. To be bound by the Holy Spirit not knowing what's going to happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await for me, he says, but I do not account my life of any value or precious to myself if only I may finish the course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul, Paul has to be obedient to God himself. And Paul is not asking the Ephesians to do anything that he's not willing to do himself. He's asking the Ephesians, Ephesians to follow his teaching uh, as he follows the teaching of Christ. And elsewhere in Scripture, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. He doesn't say follow him because he has all the answers. In fact, Paul would say in this passage that he does not have all the answers. Leader, Watch this, watch this. Leadership is not always having all the answers and knowing the future. In fact, Paul says it here. He, he says, I, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm constrained by the Spirit. I'm bound by the Spirit. But when I get there, truth be told, I don't know exactly what's going to happen to me. We, we have this little uh, game that we have in our car. It's not a game, but the kids oftentimes will ask me. They say, well, where, uh, where are we going, Daddy? And uh, I say, well, we're going to uh, a little place that's uh, known by two, uh, by, by, by two letters, L-C. They say, L-C. I said, you'll see, amen. <laughs> and uh, which, is, which is different, which is different when uh, they ask something and the answer is probably no. That's a will see, amen. <laughs> but uh, oftentimes uh, I, I, they'll say, wait, wait, where are we going? I said, you'll see. Don't, don't worry. It's going to be fine. You don't need to know where we're going. all. I may not know where we're going all the time, but, but sometimes we, we think the leader always has to know and predict and shape the future, and sometimes the leader simply cannot, cannot tell what the future is going to be. But that doesn't mean that he or she is not a good leader. You can prepare for the future without knowing exactly what it is. You, you, you can anticipate it. And, and here's the thing. If, if you're the type of person, and I put myself in this category, that you have to know exactly what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, before you uh, initiate a move yourself. You, you, you will spend the rest of your life trying to figure out what the future is because simply there are some things in the future that we just take a step in faith and we don't know what's going to happen, but we just trust God and move forward anyway. There are things that are outside of our control. There are things that we don't know. There are our actions and attitudes of, uh, of ourselves and, and, and others and historical things that are taking place in the future. We don't know all the future, but the truth is that you can lead and still move forward even if you don't know exactly what's going to happen. Paul was willing to be obedient to God. And uh, when Paul was obedient to God, he set a pattern of how others could be obedient to him as he was obedient to God. So, so great leaders act honorably and consistently. Great leaders act with obedience. Let me, let me show you a third thing great leaders do. Great leaders act with affection. Let me show you a couple places. We see this in this passage, just a couple of different places. Um, look, in verse, uh, look in verse 19. Look in verse 19. We see it in verse 19. It says, serving the Lord with all humility and with what? Tears. He weeped deeply for them. Look down in verse 28. Down in verse 28, he says, uh, he says, pray careful attention for the, all the flock in which the Lord has made you overseas to care for the church which he obtained with his own blood. He loved the church deeply. He says down in verse 37, I was there and there was much weeping on the part of all. And Paul embraced them and kissed them. Verse 31, Paul said, Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish 
every one of you with what? With tears. Paula could, have, could lead this group of people because he had deep affection for them. Now, you, you've probably heard me say, I don't know if I've ever said this, but I, I believe that hope ought to be the warmest, friendliest, most welcoming place in all South Dayton. Amen. I believe that we ought to be a church that, uh, that is kind and affectionate uh, with one another. And one of the dangers of being a church that's kind and affectionate with one another is that when other people hurt, you hurt. When other people are sad, you're sad. When other people are going through pain, you go through pain. It's been said that you can, uh, you can impress people from afar, but you can only influence people up close. And, and one of the things about leadership, and I'm talking about all the leaders that uh, are here at Hope, is that when you care for one another, that when we care for one another, that when others hurt, that it hurts us. And when others rejoice, we rejoice as well. It's amazing. A lot of times I will, I will try to figure out what makes a great teacher. In fact, uh, when I think I've told many of you I used to be a, I started out as a school teacher before I became a pastor. And uh, one of my, my mentors gave me a sign, and it still hangs in my, in, my, uh, in my study. It says, there is at least one great teacher in every child's life. Let it be you. And uh, really, one of the things I've learned, that the great coaches and great teachers that we've had in our lives, above everything else, they may not have been the smartest. They may not have been the most articulate. They may not have been the, the most winning. But they're the ones that cared the most. And uh, you've heard it, it's been a cliche, but I think it's worth saying that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And uh, this church, remember last, remember last week, remember last week when I said Paul preached all night? <laughs> Maybe the reason Paul was able to preach all night is because these people knew that Paul loved them deeply. And I said last week, and let me say it again, don't assume that people know that you love them. Don't assume that people know that you care. That every, every week there are people that are sitting on the same pew as you that would be incredibly encouraged if someone were just to communicate to them that they matter, that they care, that they're loved, and that they belong. Here's how you can tell somebody's in need of encouragement. They breathe, amen? <laughs> That's how you can tell. <laughs> if they breathe, they need encouragement. Um, and Paul was deeply affectionate with these individuals. Uh, so number one, Paul was honorable. He was, uh, he was uh, obedient. He was affectionate. Uh, no, number four, Paul was protective. Great leaders are protective of, of those that they oversee. Let me, let me show you how he did this. He, he says in verse uh, 27, he says, I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will rise speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. And can, can I just translate that in, into my own version? He, he's saying afterward, there are going to be some people from the outside that are going to try to come into the inside. And when they try to come into the inside, they're going to look like sheep, but they're really wolves and their desire is to come in and not spare anyone in the flock. And be careful of them. Yet, yet yesterday I was at uh, I was I was at Costco, and one of the things that I noticed uh, was just was just all the different security systems that they had established. How you can have uh, how you can have these security systems, and so uh, many people, even on your phone, you'll, you're you're sitting here and you will get a beep on your phone, and somebody somebody got an Amazon package here in the last hour at their house. Now listen, you don't have to check that right now. I'm just letting you know that it's there. But but you can check your doorbell, and you can make sure that uh, that the that the only thing left on your front step is the package from Amazon. Amen. That that's who is actually there. 
system set up, sensors and it's sensors and lasers and 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 and, and all, all these things set up to keep those on the outside on the outside and not coming in on the inside because because oftentimes uh, wolves can come in and masquerade themselves as sheep. And the whole intention is to deceive and to destroy. So he's saying, watch out for those on the outside and don't let those on the outside get on the inside. Only those that are intending to deceive and to destroy. Deceptive people, divisive people. He's saying those individuals, he says, be watchful for them. But, but then he says, now, he said, you also got to be careful for those that are on the inside. Look, look how he words it here. He says, uh, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw disciples after them. Have you noticed how often it's an inside job? It, it, it wasn't the Egyptians that, uh, that kidnapped Joseph. His own brother sold him into slavery. Who, who was it that betrayed Jesus with a kiss? Was it not Judas, one of the 12 that was among him? It's usually an inside job. And tell the truth, tell the truth. The people in your life that cause you the most grief oftentimes have lived, are living, or will live under your roof. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> it's the inside job. You don't need to be a uh, forensic detective to fill that out, amen, <laughs> to figure that thing out. It's usually an inside job. The people that cause us oftentimes the most grief are the ones that we share, that we share our lives most closely with. It's one of the things I think that we make a mistake in just in terms of parents and society. We, we do really good at teaching our children about stranger danger. Don't, 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 don't go away with strangers and don't, go, don't get in cars with people you don't know. And I absolutely agree all of those things. But, but, but do you know what the studies really show? The studies really show that the things that are most harmful to children, most harmful to youth, are, are, are usually, usually much much closer to home and usually somebody that is somewhat familiar with the individual. That's what the studies would show. And let me just, let me, let me just say something here, parental. Can I just talk to the parents for a second? Let's talk to the parents for a second. This may get me in trouble. I mean, I'll just say it anyway. I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> um, you can look this up. I'm not making this up. Usually, um, usually children messing around with something or someone that they should not usually happens statistically when they're spending the night at a friend's house. A child's first exposure usually to alcohol, to, uh, to tobacco, to pornography, to drugs, and to uh, um, um, physical things, the majority of times takes place while spending the night with a friend. You don't believe me? You don't believe me? No, don't answer this out loud. Look at your own life. Amen. That's usually when it happens. It's usually at the place where you think that you trust the individual. That's usually when it happens. Now, I say that to say that just because someone is close to you and just because someone may share um, interest with your child does not mean that that's always the safest place for the child to be. Can somebody say amen? amen? Now, I know that's kind of heavy, so let me, let me bring this back. In some ways, 
Remember, it was Judas that betrayed Jesus. It was Joseph's brothers that betrayed him. Oftentimes, those that we need to warn ourselves about and others about are oftentimes those that are the closest, not those that are strangers. And if we would, uh, if we would warn one another, if we would warn our children, if we would warn those that we're seeing, those that we're responsible for, about those that are close to them, as much as we worry about those that are far away, oftentimes they could be much more safe, much more secure, and much more hopeful. Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. I didn't upset anybody there, did I? I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be helpful this morning. It's always an inside job. That's why, watch this, remember when, remember when China built the, the Great Wall, amen? If y'all remember that, you're much older than I think you are, amen? <laughs> it, to separate China from Mongolia, it didn't work. Do you know why it didn't work? Because you can erect a wall, but you cannot change the character of the people that were bribed to let people across that wall. Always an inside job. One of the things great leaders do is it warns. It warns those that they oversee of those that are close and those that are far away. I'm thankful that Paul had the boldness here to say, wait a minute, you need to watch out. You need to watch out for those that... Uh, that are on the outside, but you also need to be careful of those that are on the inside. The main problem, the main challenges in terms of divisiveness, in terms of division, in terms of, uh, of heresy, is not those outside the church. Generation after generation, it's someone from inside the church that begins to stir things up and to hurt those from within. So great leaders are protective of those that they oversee. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me share with you two more things. The fifth thing a great leader does, a great leader does, is a, a great leader is focused. In here, Paul's whole life is about one message. Paul's got one sermon. Like, like, have you noticed this? Let's tell the truth. We've been asked for a little over a year. We've been, every sermon says the same thing. Every sermon says the same thing. It's, it's the same message every time. And basically, it's this message, that you need to repent and come to Jesus. From Genesis chapter 1 until Revelation chapter 20, same thing. You need to repent and come to Jesus. Look, look here, Paul says in verse 20, how I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you, testifying both the Jews and the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The same message Paul had his whole life. His whole life, one message, one message Paul had, one message. Turn from your sin and turn to Christ. And we notice in there, he says the same message to the Greeks and to the Jews. So he wasn't telling the Jews, you know what, because you're children of Abraham, you don't need to worry about the sin thing because uh, you're covered because you're descendants of Abraham. No, he's telling the Jews, you need to repent and come to Jesus. He's telling the Greeks, you know what, just because you weren't given the promises, just because you weren't given the law doesn't mean that you're... Um, that, that you're excluded from having to obey the law, that uh, just, just as the Jews uh, did not follow the law, even you did not follow the law by violating your own conscience. So you know he tells the, the Gentiles, you need, you need to repent and come to Jesus. And basically the gospel is this, that you and I are lost and sinful without Jesus, because he has invited us to come to him, and we can come to him and be forgiven. The same message for all people, in all generations, repent and come to Jesus. He was consistent. So as a great leader, Paul was, he was honorable. He was obedient. He, um, he was affectionate. He was protective. He was focused. Let me show you this final thing, and that was that he was sacrificial. Um... Look with me in verse 34. He says, You know how these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me, and in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way we must help the weak and remember the words of Jesus, how he said, 
it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul was willing to work hard on behalf of himself and on behalf of those that, um, that were entrusted to his care. And he was about what he could give, not what he could receive. It said here he didn't care about anybody's gold. He didn't care about anybody's silver. He didn't care about anybody's uh, designer clothes. That's, that's, what it's, that's, that's my translation. He, he didn't care about those things. He, did, he, didn't, he didn't want things from people. He wanted things for people. It's not that he wanted anything from the Ephesians, but he wanted something for the Ephesians. And because of that, he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive, and therefore we ought to be careful to remember one another. And let me show you how this plays out in the life of our church. Um, I, I know I quote him all the time, but I, I, I love the writings of Dr. Tim Keller. And Keller, in writing about poverty, says something profound. He says, if you look at the scriptures, there are three um, sources of poverty. Three sources of poverty. Uh, the first source is laziness. A person is poor because they simply choose not to work or to work hard. The second uh, source of poverty is, um, is exploitation. You're poor or a person's poor because of circumstances outside of their life where they're being exploited by others and they have no control over it. It may be based on... Uh, Maybe based on where you live, it may be based on, uh, on what your background is, it may be based on, uh, on circumstances, it may be based on education, maybe it's just some factors outside yourself that you simply cannot control because somebody is benefiting from your poverty. And then there's a third, and that is what we call devastation. And that means that, uh, that uh, Individuals are poor, individuals suffer because of circumstances outside of their control. Maybe, for example, a tornado went through and, and destroyed all the crops. Maybe there was a massive recession and, uh, and all your assets, were, all your assets were, um, were, were disposed of. Maybe there was a, a massive famine taking place. Maybe somewhere else in the world something happened to the stock market that made things happen here. Maybe a factory closes and, and leaves the community, but, but some kind of devastation that you have no control over. Now here's the thing. So, so you have three forms of poverty. You have laziness, you have exploitation, and you have devastation. The problem is we seem to address all forms of poverty in one particular way. So for example, if, 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 a, if an individual is poor because, be, because of exploitation or because of uh, devastation, hard work may not pull them out of it. Or, or if, uh, if um, say, uh, say a person, is, let's say on the opposite example, let's suppose that a person is suffering not because they're not, not because they're um, uh, facing a devastation, but if a person is suffering because they're poor, then it does not matter how many opportunities are given to that individual. If the issue is idleness, that doesn't make, it's, it's not going to make any difference how many, how many uh, programs are rolled out to help that individual. So what Keller says is that we have, we have these three factors. We have, we, we have, according to scripture, we have laziness, we have, we have, um, exploitation, and then we have also tragedy or devastation. And we deal with devastation issues in a, with a devastation remedy. We deal with uh, exploitation by seeking justice. We deal with, we deal with idleness by, by participating in work. Does that make sense? So, so to think that all the solutions of poverty are either programs or just pull yourself up by your bootstraps straps, it minimizes the multiple layers that are caused by it. But he says here that we ought to do what we can for those that are struggling because it's better to give than to receive. So let me bring this into our campaign now. One of the things that we're doing now is we are um, We are focusing on those that have been impacted by the storm. We know in the city of Trotwood, 450 families alone, in Trotwood alone, 
are not in their homes. Homes have been destroyed. Um, that's now, what, almost nine months after the tragedy. What we're doing is we're not helping individuals that are suffering because of exploitation. We're not helping individuals that are suffering because of laziness. We're helping individuals that are suffering because of something devastating that is out of their control. And that is that when a storm went through, the only character flaw that these individuals had is they actually happened to be living in a property that was in the path of a storm. And so what we're going to do in this campaign is we're going to, uh, we're going to provide Christmas for 40 families whose, storm, whose, whose homes were hit by storms. All kind of different families, same community, and the same storm. Remember when Jesus talks about the, uh, the storm that goes through and the, the, the solid foundation, the weak foundation, and how one house is built on the rock and one house is built on the sand? The thing that those two, those two families have in common, both homes were hit by the same storm. And so it's going to be a great privilege for us to give rather than to receive. So I'm going to ask us to look at this video as we, uh, as we learn a little bit more about this project and how our sacrificial giving is going to help 40 families in the Trotwood community have Christmas this year. <laughs> 